We start um, talking about eukaryotes today, and we're going to start with, well, let's be honest, well, I'll be honest with you, fungi are my least favorite microbes. Uh, if they're not mushrooms, then I like to eat them, but fungi per se, not really. So there are two types of fungi, molds and yeasts. Molds are colonial multicellular organisms that consist of hyphae. You can see hyphae in this illustration, this um, long branch-like protrusions. And interwoven system of hyphae is called mycelium. So when now when you go somewhere, new, when you take out the, the moldy bread, you can say, look, what a nice mycelium on this bread. Okay, you don't have to say, oh crap, I need to throw it away. Um, so colony is essentially a mycelium. Does that make sense? Now, molds refer specifically to those velvety, cottony structures. You have to appreciate, though, that mushrooms that you can see on the soil sometimes, they are parts of the big organism. Each mushroom is not an individual organism. Those are reproductive bodies of gigantic mycelium that grows, for instance, in your backyard. Okay, But enough of my mushrooms, let's go back to the molds. There are two types of hyphae. Vegetative hyphae, sometimes called mycelia themselves, responsible for nutrient absorption, digestion and absorption of nutrients. For instance, this submerged hyphae, say it's a fungal growth on the um, a strawberry. The submerged hyphae will destroy the strawberry cells, will lyse them, and will um, the nutrients that result after this lysis will be absorbed by the, uh, by the vegetative hyphae. The reproductive or fertile hyphae are responsible for the spore formation. Every minute, I don't know the numbers, but we inhale thousands and thousands of fungal spores every minute or every hour. We inhale millions of them. They are everywhere. Believe me, so it's just, they're everywhere, fungal spores. We're constantly exposed to the fungi. Okay. Hyphae. I can picture hyphae something like this. So imagine there's a, a long thread and there are some separations, partial separation. So each of these fragments, we can call it a septa. Well, septum. Many of those fragments are septa. You don't have to know about the septa septum. But the idea is that hyphae that have those separations, uh, like like this one, you can see that's a septum, called septate hyphae. In some molds, though, hyphae are non-septate. Does that make sense? It's pretty much... Huh? Question? So, septate hyphae is the chain of cells, chain of fungal cells. Non-septate hyphae is one long, continuous, uninterrupted cell. Am I clear? Are we clear? Okay. Understand the terminology. Septate versus non-septate. Vegetative versus reproductive hyphae. Molds are multicellular. Yeasts. Yeasts are single-celled fungi. Don't get tricked by this photograph in the upper right corner. Yeasts can form colonies, and by colonies I mean you have many cells growing together. Remember you, you placed your bacterial samples onto the slide and looked at it after the, under the microscope. Did you see one cell or many? So many, right? Many bacterial cells. Some of them were even organized in chains or clusters like tetrads or diplococci, 
but it doesn't mean that those organisms are multicellular. Same goes for yeasts. They do not have functional differentiation of cells. All yeast cells are the same. You can take one cell and it'll start to replicate like nothing happened before that. Yeasts, um, and this is the typical yeast cell with all the typical structures, you know, the nucleus, the uh, endoplasmic, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and so on and so forth. And yeasts replicate by budding. The new cell buds off the old cell. And the place where it buds off is marked by the bud scar. So budding is one of the major um, ways for yeast reproduction. It is somewhat like the binary fission. Right? Everything replicates, cells separate. Something like it. Does that make sense? So essentially, in when there are several divisions going one after another, yeast sometimes form so-called pseudohyphae, chains of the yeast cells. These cells are functionally independent. They are attached to each other, but it seems that there is no importance in that attachment. You can separate them and they're going to be just fine. Does that make sense? So that's why we call it pseudohyphae. Pseudohyphae is the yeast feature. Yeasts, as other fungi, pretty much all fungi, can produce asexual spores, which for yeast, called blastospores, and sexual spores. Now, asexuals, first of all, yeasts are deployed. Do you understand what deployed means? So, yeah, two copies of each chromosome. And asexual sports are deployed too. So, they have exactly the same genetic arrangement as the parent cell. Sexual sports are what? If they're not diploid, then they haploid. So when two sexual spores fuse, that contributes to the genetic diversity in, in fungi. Kind of jumping ahead, asexual spores are not a very important component of genetic diversity in fungi. Right? Yeasts. What are the important yeasts that you know? Don't have you don't have to give the fancy Latin name. Brewer's yeast. That's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's single most important <laughs> fungal organism that we use in the industrial applications, from from brewery to baking to. Uh, biotechnology. In terms of pathogenesis, can you think of any without looking at the PowerPoint? Indeed, albicans. Anything else? Infection that is extremely common in children. It's not a worm. Well, thrushes is the same. It's candida. It's candida albicans. Although it is called a worm, it is not a worm. Ringworm, yeah, it's a fungal infection. It's called ringworm, but it has nothing to do with the worm. Okay, also fungal. Now, some yeasts, well, some, should I say, fungi, they can exist in both mold and yeast form. They exist as molds in the nature, in the, at the ambient temperature, like 25, 25 degrees Celsius. You know, 75, for instance. When they get into the human body, which is much warmer, and I'm talking about inside, they start to reproduce as yeast. The example of such pathogen is Histoplasma capsulatum, which is environmental fungus that causes respiratory, the lung disease in humans. Now, how we talked about yeast, so like kind of sum up the yeast reproduction. Budding, asexual, 
uh, blastospores and sexual spores. What about moles? What about moles? There are two major types of spores and all you have to know is the fun is the difference between these two types I we're not gonna get into this this details so there are sporangiospores and conidiospores okay so sporangiospores are released from the structure that is called sporangia think about this as the bubble that is filled with spores. Does that make sense? Canidiospores are essentially hyphae, fragments of hyphae that chip off the hyphae. Does that make sense? Like the arthrospores or chlamydospores or phyllospores. So the structural difference is that sporangiospores are formed in a structure called sporangium. Canidiospores are result from the fragmentation of hyphae. Now, sexual spores. They increase genetic variation, yes, but they're not really important for that they're not really important for genetic variation okay I'll, I'll stress it out it's not by any means the main mechanism they are formed under the harsh environmental conditions and that's kind of makes sense because when the environment changes and changes unfavorably then forming a structure that can contribute to the evolution contribute to the adaptation makes perfect sense in otherwise normal conditions fungi form asexual spores okay now we never talked about antifungal agents we talked about some antiviral we incorporated that into the discussion of HIV and um, Influenza. What about antifungal? What is the major challenge with treating fungal infections? I'm not going to give you any hints. Why it's so easy to treat bacteria? Well, easy. Not only take bigger picture, look at the bigger picture. Bacterial cells But why why people don't die from the drugs from those drugs? Why? <laughs> why they don't attack There you go. Because bacteria are prokaryotes, humans are eukaryotes. So the structures are very different, right? What about fungi? The eukaryotes. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. The good um, selective toxicity for fungal antifungal agents is a challenge. Okay, and it turns out most of antifungal drugs are pretty toxic. Okay, the first class of the drugs that I want to discuss is polyene drugs. Polyene means multiple double bonds between carbons, organic carbons, so it's polyene. Polyene is like this molecule of amphotericin B. Another drug is nystatin. These drugs bind membranes. Amphotericin B is very toxic. In some cases, doctors have to weigh whether they want to use amphotericin B on the patient, treat the disease but cause enormous toxicity, or just try something else. It's effective, but very toxic. Griseofolvin is an effective topical treatment against the ringworm. 
and it inhibits the synthesis of microtubules. Microtubules are necessary for formation of mitotic spindle, therefore cell division, so it essentially inhibits the cell division and eventually worm just, uh, worm, uh, fungus just dies itself. There are no new cells are formed and will die eventually. Flucytosin is the analog of the cytosine, so it can inhibit the replication, the DNA transcription, sorry, DNA synthesis in the fungus. It's fairly toxic, can be used to treat cutaneous mycosis. Mycosis is the general name for any fungal disease. And in combination with amphotericin B, can be used to treat systemic ones. Probably the most well-known and the most commonly used class of drugs against fungi are azoles. You've heard about the drugs like clotrimazole, fluconazole, uh, ketoconazole. Um, you do not have to know the um, structures, absolutely not. I hope you understand that. But, question, yes, go ahead. DNA synthesis, that's flucytosin, yes. So azoles inhibit synthesis of a molecule called ergosterol. Ergosterol is a component of the fungal cell membrane. And when there is no ergosterol, fungal cell becomes unstable, structural unstable, and dies. Does that make sense? Take home message before we talk about as a little bit more. What you have to know is the mechanism for the drugs. So I ask you, what does amphotericin B do? Destabilizes membrane. What does fluconazole or azole drugs do? They inhibit ergosterol synthesis. Okay? So there are essentially one, two, three, four classes of drugs. Now, azoles used, you know, depending on what they are, they use differently. It is determined by specific toxicity, by availability, but they are widely used to treat both topical mycosis, um, the skin cutaneous mycosis, and systemic mycosis, such as thrush, vaginal candidiasis, and other systemic um, fungal infections. Any questions before we go in forward? Good? Cutaneous infection. Well, ringworm. Okay. There's a, a ringworm and tinea versicolor. Um, they are caused by this for genera. You, all you have to know about these four genera of fungi is that they cause cutaneous mycosis. This is it. Now, cutaneous means associated with the skin. How would you think these conditions are transmitted? What do you yeah, touching. Also, some cutaneous mycosis like tinea pedis, can be acquired from soil because fungi are everywhere in the soil. Now, names for the diseases. Tinea means worm. Tinea corporis, body. Tinea pedis, foot. Tinea capatis, scalp. Barbie, beard, ungum, nails, and curious groin. Don't waste your time memorizing those names. Understand that these four genera, Malassezia, Trichophytone, Epidermophytone, and Microsporum, they cause cutaneous mycosis. The virulence factor, that's one thing I want you to know, virulence factor. They degrade keratin, so they essentially degrade the main protein component. They degrade keratin. 
it's a major chemical major protein component of the skin that's how the mycosis develops uh, it is not a life-threatening condition but it's sort of an unpleasant thing to to have they fairly easily treated by a number of topical drugs in some cases the systemic application of azoles uh, necessary but other than that they fairly easily treated that make sense Any questions did I articulate clear enough what I want from you? you know. Did I? Neurotropic infections. That's much more exciting. Two, there are many. I'm going to give you examples of two. Cryptococcus and Coccidioides. Cryptococcus neoformans is sort of a community acquired and zoonotically acquired infection. Uh, it can be found in the bird's droppings and inhaled. And from the lungs, Cryptococcus neoformans can enter neurons and end up in the meninges. Okay. So it causes fairly severe meningitis but the cohort of people that is susceptible to cryptococcal infection uh, is practically restricted to immunocompromised, mostly AIDS patients. It's the most common cause of meningitis in AIDS patients. Does that make sense? So that, remember, you will see that pretty much all fungal infections affect first and foremost immunocompromised people, whether they are AIDS patients or they have immunosuppressive therapy, yeah, something like that. Cryptococcus causes typical symptoms of meningitis with headache and stiff neck. And it's interesting, you can see it has a capsule, like some bacteria have. Cryptococcus has a capsule of, of its own. Bless you. That make sense? And it doesn't have any specific geographical distribution. Okay, Cryptococcus doesn't. Unlike Coccidioides immitis, also called valley fever, it is endemic for the areas in the southwestern U.S. You can see it's Mexico. Well, Mexico is not southwestern U.S., but uh, southern California, southern Arizona, New Mexico, and even Texas. Um, can be acquired from environment. Uh, in, it starts with a pulmonary infection that quickly becomes systemic and can cause meningitis. Okay. Um, again, people who are immunocompromised are at higher risk. And I will give you a little summary of how healthy people can acquire those infections. Respiratory infections. Histoplasma capsulatum. Is proudly called Ohio Valley Fever or Histoplasmosis. It exists in the mold form. It's a dimorphic fungus. It exists in the mold form outside in the forest. It actually can be found in the deep forestation and exists in the form of the yeast in the lungs. So, who are at risk? immunocompromised people and those who work in the forest essentially lumberjacks because if histoplasma is present it's a zoonotic disease it's in the droppings of birds and bats if histoplasma is present in the environment and people you know work as lumberjacks what happens to those feces they get in the air, they get aerosolized, so people inhale it. And it is known that when people, you know, work with with lumber and, and cut the trees and a lot of the that aerosol flying around, they it's kind of a professional risk. Does that make sense? Even if the person is healthy, 
person can acquire histoplasmosis because the infectious dose will be very high. Does that make sense? So if you walk through the forest and you're healthy, the chances you pick up the disease are pretty slim because your immune system is fine. But if there is an aerosol around, if you work in these conditions all the time, you constantly inoculate yourself. And that increases your chances to develop a systemic um, lung infection. So it grows in the macrophages. And the infection, is, the infection is opportunistic, so not very many people become actually ill. Uh, this map here in the bottom shows you the distribution of histoplasma capsulatum in the United States. And you can see that the states where it's most abundant are the states of the pretty much north Midwest. Okay. Extends as far west as Nebraska. And pretty on the east, it actually stops in Ohio. Um, mortality is relatively low, and in this case, we talk about more of a not mortality but case fatality ratio. How can you avoid this disease? Well, if you work in the conditions like if you work as a lumberjack, wear the mask, protect yourself from uh, aerosols. It's a personal protective equipment. Does that make sense? Yes. What are this? Pneumonia. It's pretty much pneumonia. It's shortness of breath, um, pneumonia, high fever, lung infection. Pneumocystis girovecci. I'm going to ask this question one more time. Who goes to professions, okay, who goes to nursing or any other profession, medical profession, where you will take immediate care of patients? Huh? Like nursing. Who goes to nursing? Is that it? That's kind of surprising. Everybody goes to nursing? Nursing. Who goes to nursing? I'm asking you. A lot of people. A lot? Yeah. Quite a lot. Yeah. You go to nursing. So you're going to see, what I mean is, I don't, I'm not asking if you're going to be a radiology tech, because that's a different story. You're kind of more distant from a patient. So you're going to work with patients. This disease is the hallmark for AIDS patients. It's called sometimes PCP. It has nothing to do with a legal drug. PCP stands for pneumocystic pneumonia. It's called by the fungus called pneumocystis girovecci. Okay, if you have a patient with rash purple spots on the skin, shortness of breath and diarrhea, that is probably patient with AIDS, purple spots are Kaposi sarcoma, uh, shortness of breath due to the pneumocystis cerevecci, and diarrhea is due to the cryptosporidium parvum infection. It's like classical set of secondary infections in AIDS patients or patients with progressed HIV, okay? Um, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Diagnosis, so this is pneumocystis cells in the lung, and this is the uh, pneumocystic pneumonia of inferior lobes of the lungs, okay? In, now, you have to appreciate diagnosis, Yes, we do have to do the diagnosis. It's going to be something like immune staining. But the when you have several, you know, symptoms, several conditions like HIV positive, very low T cell count, shortness of breath, probably PCP, start treating. Interestingly enough, PCP is sensitive to sulfur drugs, trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole, TMPSMX, like 
antibacterial drug. It can be used to treat this fungal disease as well. It's treatable, but as you can imagine, what would be the major, like if you have an AIDS patient or progressed, you know, developed HIV patient with really low T cell counts and who has pneumocystic pneumonia, what you're going to focus on, treating the pneumonia or do something else? What do you have to treat first? What HIV and pneumocystic pneumonia, what do you have to treat first? Well, pneumonia you're going to treat, but HIV is most, because if you treat HIV, if you reduce, if you restore the T cell counts, then the immune system will chip in. Does that make sense? Remember I told you, and I'm going to repeat it again and again, with fungal infections, it's about the immune system. If the immune system is fine, humans don't really get infected. Think about this. Which mycosis do we get as children or as adults? What it can be? Ringworm, athlete's foot. That's pretty much it. Okay? When children get thrush, when they, their immune system immunocompromised or when they are antibiotics, so their microbiome is compromised. Does that make sense? Bacterial vagin... Um, Bacterial vaginal candidiasis often is a result of the antibiotic treatment. The microbiome gets compromised. Mycosis are abnormal in people. Systemic mycosis are hugely abnormal in people. Does that make sense? Okay. Protozoa. Those are single-celled eukaryotic organisms. Protozoa do not have chloroplasts. Single-celled organisms that have chloroplasts are what? Algae, yes. Some people, you know, put algae and protozoa into the protists, but protozoa what does zoa mean? Animal. Algae are not animals. Protozoa are animals. So they single-celled eukaryotic organisms. They have very important feature. All of them lack cell wall. Absolutely no exceptions. All protozoa have no cell wall, which warrants somewhat of um, flexibility. You have to appreciate that flexibility is not that they can acquire any shape. Amoeba can change its shape quite considerably, but some other species like um, the flagellated protozoa, ciliated protozoa, have pretty fixed shape. They can bend, of course, you know, there are some changes, but um, you will not see plasmodium going from uh, like a, a shape of a shoe into some crazy square or circle or something like that, okay? The uh, cytoplasm of protozoa can be divided into two parts, ectoplasm, which is the outer layer. The function of that ectoplasm is mostly feeding and movement, and endoplasm, which houses all the Organelles, like vacuoles, nucleus, and mitochondria. Um, now, before we move on, some forms of protozoa can have more than one nucleus. Do we, so ectoplasm, endoplasm, lack of cell wall, we got it? Some, many actually, many protozoa form cysts. If you would look, I thought about throwing in the life cycle. We would spend like 40 minutes just going over the life cycle. So I decided to just picture it for you. And this is the concept, the, the only thing that I want you to, to, uh, to get. 
and it's going to be extremely schematic. This is cyst, the protozoan. When cyst gets into the host, it becomes not host, but cyst becomes trophozoite. T R O P H O Z O I T E. What does the word trophol mean? Like trough. Hmm? When we say the the something is heterotroph or the trough trough. Trophic relationship between animals. What they eat. So trophozoite is the form that feeds, replicates, leaves. Cysts do not replicate, do not feed, they survive. Cysts are somewhat analogous in their function to endospore. So when would you expect cysts to form? Mm -hmm. Now what would you think be the unfavorable condition for the protozoa? It can be dry. For some of them, it is simply existing outside of the host. The moment they leave the body, they insist. Insistment. Insistment is essentially formation of the cyst. Does that make sense? And that, that's the cycle. Cysts, now think about this. When we consume protozoan cysts, they, are these conditions favorable when they, for instance, in a gut? Compared to soil. Warm, wet, a lot of food. There's competition with a lot of food. So when we com consume the cyst of a protozoa, cyst becomes trophozoite in the gut. For instance, in the gut. Does that make sense? When cysts leave human gut with feces, when trophozoites, sorry, leave the gut with feces, they become cysts again and survive outside. Then we consume them again. Does that make sense? That's a very typical, although generic, life cycle of a protozoa. Not all protozoa form cysts, don't get me wrong. Do we get the concept of cyst and trophozoite? Which form can feed and which form cannot, which form replicates and which form cannot replicate. Okay? How do we classify them? That's the simple classification. Actual proper taxonomy is mind-boggling. It's not the purpose. So we're going to classify them, and that's a pretty common way, based on the meaning for locomotion. Okay? So don't, get, don't, don't think it's a complete table. No, 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 no way. But... Type number one is Sarcodina or Pseudopodia. Those are the protozoa that use amoeboid motion to move around, like amoeba. Okay, these microorganisms feed by phagocytosing other cells. It can be bacteria, it can be human cells if it's human pathogen. Okay. The examples are Entamoeba histolytica and Nigleria fowleri. I showed the microorganisms that are in the pictures in bold. So this is Nigleria fowleri. It's amoeba. And we'll, we'll talk about this infection. Second class is Mastigophora, which are flagellated protozoa. Okay. So example of such 
flagellated protozoa is Giardia lamblia. You see that Giardia has four flagella, one pole of the cell. Um, they may have very complex life cycles. Some of them may lose flagellum during the development. So, uh, as far as I remember, Trypanosoma brucei and Trypanosoma cruzi, Trypanosoma cruzi cause it patient of Chagas disease. When it infects humans, it's flagellated. But in, in the blood, it loses flagellum. And we'll discuss why, what can be the reason for it. Um, cilia. Microorganisms that use cilia are called ciliophora, the entire cell. Paramecium, not in the picture. It's that innocent, free-living protozoa that some of you had a chance to see when we did the microscopy lab before. The one that I show you here is Balintidium coli, the causative agent of protozoan diarrhea. And finally, AP complexa, sometimes called sporozoa. Now, the name sporozoa is misleading. Protozoan organisms do not form spores. It's the remnant of the old, quote-unquote, belief that they do. They do not form spores, okay? Apicomplexa are non-motile, which means they cannot move at all. And they are obligate parasites. For, ex for example, Plasmodium falciparum, causative agent of malaria, is apicomplex. Now, you tell me why sarcodina, amoeboid motion, mastigophora, flagella motion, or ciliophora, ciliated motion, can be free living, living in the soil, in the water, and apicomplexa cannot, they must be parasite. Tell me why. Hmm? So, Yes, exactly. So if they consume food that's around them, they can't move to the new nutrient source. They have environment that would move around them, like blood, lymph, extracellular fluid. Does that make sense? Is that understood? So going back to trypanosoma, when trypanosoma infects humans, it has flagellum. And it gets in the blood, it loses flagellum. It doesn't need it anymore. It's in the blood. Okay? It's now parasitic. Well, let's talk about these lovely guys. A um, little disclaimer. I did not include every... So, I did not include every potential protozoan disease that I can think of. Unfortunately, I skipped on many. I skipped on uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, I skipped on Giardia lambli, and many others. Um, my purpose is to go over this and, and helminthic infections um, before we run out of time today and, and Monday, and have some time on Monday t for the review. Okay? That makes sense? But I'm going to drop some info on other microbes. If microbes are not in the PowerPoint, I just love to chat about those guys. And they horrible enough. You know, it makes them interesting. Panasoma brucei is the causative agent of African sleeping sickness. It's a mystigophora. Okay? Flagellated protozoa. Do I have it somewhere here? No. So flagellated protozoa transmitted you can see the trypanosoma with the little flagella in the blood you can actually observe those 
that's one of the one of the ways to diagnose the infection just to take the blood smear um, it's transmitted by the tsetse flies that's a little tsetse fly from the stand yeah from the standpoint of insect taxonomy the fly and the mosquito they belong to the same order dipter i think i think it's dipter so they technically very similar and trypanosoma brucei is the zoonotic disease it persists in cattle and buffaloes you know large animals and tsetse flies transmit this disease to humans by bite taking a blood mill this infection has a long incubation period you can you can see that you know that that's tsetse fly takes the blood mill okay um, trypanosoma brucei can multiply in the gut of the fly so it's biological vector and then when it tsetse fly takes another blood meal it injects the um, trypanosoma in the human it replicates in the human and then the cycle goes back again we don't have cattle in this cycle but it can go from cattle to humans from humans to cattle cattle maintains this cycle turns out interestingly enough when European colonists um, came to Africa, they wanted to establish their own colonies of, of cattle, cows. They brought European cows to Africa. What do you think happened to those poor cows? They died specifically of this. They died of African sleeping sickness because they didn't co-evolve with that parasite for a long time and they were not tolerant to this parasite so they lost the cattle actually um, so the micro well microorganism when it enters the blood and spreads through the circulation through the lymphatic system to multiple organs including CNS and it may stay dormant for a long time and then the disease can develop really slow so it develops Major manifestations include organ failure, uh, joint pain, splenomegaly, and in the CNS, especially in the CNS, it leads to a, a set of symptoms from confusion and alterations in the mood to sleep disturbances. That's why it is called sleeping sickness. People become sleepy for the lack of better word they it's not that they like sleep well okay they kind of in that um stupor most of the time and as you can imagine this condition especially since it progresses over a long period of time this condition has a huge economical impact in the communities in africa it's really interesting um you can match the number of infections of tsetse flies to the number of tsetse flies. Regions with a higher populations of tsetse flies have higher rates of um, African sleeping sickness. There is no vaccine. There are a number of options. And generally speaking, this disease can be treated. And the course of disease, especially if it's not too progressed, because microorganism causes the tissue damage, if it's not too progressed, you can cure the person. However, the person who once acquired African sleeping sickness is considered to be positive for it for the rest of their lives, which means you cannot donate blood. Same goes for Chagas disease. Um, it is caused by a different just this is not an exam 
but you will hear about Chagas disease in the United States way more than about African sleeping sickness. It's Trypanosoma cruzi. And it's present in South America, interestingly enough, transmitted by black fly, and interestingly enough, can be found in the southern United States, especially southern Texas on the border with Mexico. Mexico is endemic for Chagas disease. Um, no slipping sickness, just multiple organ failure. Miserable disease, however, also can be treated. There's no vaccine. So what is the best strategy? It's a vector-borne disease. The best strategy for prevention. Huh? Stay inside. Control the vector. And we're kind of getting to the point where we're going to discuss how can you control the vector. Well, in Africa, it's, it's impossible to stay inside for the most people. Amoebae. These organisms are free-living. And I'm going to just hit you hard with the most horrible amoebic disease possible, which is called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Or, as some media refer to this organism, brain-eating amoeba. It's Neglaria fowleri, which can be found all over the world and all over the United States. Although, to, in the United States, it is more common to the southern states, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana. This amoeba lives in soil and in the water of ponds and lakes, not so much rivers, practically not rivers, warm water. Rivers are colder, right, because the water flows. And it is not a primary pathogen of humans. It is acquired mostly by children when they swim in those ponds and lakes. You know, when you swim, you sometimes snort the water. There's a little thing in your, the roof of the nasal cavity called the cribiform plate. Oh, actually, it's, it's, well, I'm not going to punish you for that. That's my mistake. I used to call it cribiform. It's cribriform. It's cribriform. Cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. What's on the top of the cribriform plate? Olfactory bulbs that extend into the olfactory nerves. From olfactory and cribriform plate, if you would look at it, it has a lot of tiny, small what? Huh? Holes through which olfactory neurons extend themselves into the nasal cavity. So when bacteria gets into your nasal cavity, it, it just simply gets to the olfactory neuro, uh, uh, bulbs through the, those little holes. Does that make sense? And there, it feels, I believe, very lonely and stuck. And both are true. It is stuck there. It doesn't go anywhere. Well, it has to, I mean, it has only one way to go, you know, brain. And it migrates to the brain, eating the brain, parenchyma, on its way there. Right? So symptoms include meningitis. <coughs> and you can see Neglaria fowleri, it's in the blood, uh, surrounded by neutrophils. But it migrates through the nerves to the brain causing severe encephalitis and severe meningitis, which usually manifests as the um, leucos with leukocytosis, confusion, very high fever. Sometimes con it's not just confusion, the person becomes unresponsive, mostly kids. Unfortunately, the prognosis for this disease is very poor. Uh, most cases of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis are lethal. 
bless you, it is extremely hard to diagnose because they are very infrequent. Um, there may be like four or five cases a year in the United States. So we talk about few cases. It's extremely hard to diagnose. And often the diagnosis is made too late. And, you know, it's good when people give you a proper history. They tell, I just, it was, I listened to that podcast and they consider clinical cases, parasitic clinical cases, and one of them was a case of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. It was the only case that ended up in death. And that's how this infection goes. Um, there were one or two cases a couple of years ago when they managed to treat the girl, they definitely managed to treat one girl and actually she recovered, but the brain damage, it's a brain damage. So she had like speech disturbances and so she had, it's, it's like a stroke. Fragments of the brain are eaten out. They just destroyed, physically gone. Okay. And the treatment is amphotericin B, which is toxic by itself. Okay. So in, in the north, it's not that common because of the water temperature. But technically speaking, question, technically speaking, this amoeba is everywhere. Now, a cant amoeba different species in Balamuthia mandrillaris. Um, cause granulomatous amoebic meningoencephalitis. Sounds like a tongue breaker. Granulomatous means that amoebic infiltrations in the brain, um, they form granulomas due to the infiltrations of white blood cells and essentially disrupt the brain tissue. This is more treatable. And what is important, the granulomatous amoebic meningoencephalitis, I'm not enjoying saying the entire thing, progresses slowly. The amoeba enters through the broken skin, mostly. And um, there was a wonderful case that I listened to. Um, it was in South America kids were playing outside like all the time kids play outside and parents noticed that both kids developed some mental alterations uh, mood changes and be become, the boy be became aggressive and memory problems what they also noticed are the brownish spots on the elbows and knees you know, when kids play, they sometimes you know, play on the knees, and in South America, so they wear shorts. So it was Balamuthia mandrillaris. It, the, the skin infection, the cutaneous infection, gave this brown spots, and then it migrated all the way to the brain and caused CNS symptoms. Kids were treated and, and recovered completely. But it's, it's slower developing. You can see that's the tissue of the patient. You can see the necrotic lesions. Um, in the brain, the patient that died from the granulomatous amoebic meningoencephalitis. So I hope I scared you enough. Now we're going to talk about something a little bit more benign. The amoebiasis, amoebic infection of the gut. It is called by the microbe called Entamoeba histolytica. Um, microscopically, it is not very remarkable microbe. <laughs> Um, the transmission is, of course, fecal oral. Due to the poor sanitation, uh, fecal residue can end up on the food or in the water in the drinks. And then the microbe localizes itself to the parts of the large intestine. And then the large intestine, it starts to release the exoenzymes that destroy the tissue, causing the erosive lesions, okay, erosive ulcers. First of all, it causes malabsorption and therefore diarrhea. If the erosion of the mucosal membrane is significant enough, it can cause bleeding. 
that means dysentery. And I want to highlight amoebiasis can be chronic, it can last for weeks and sometimes months. Dysentery. If it is left untreated or if immune system is compromised, then perforation of the intestine can lead to, well, appendicitis is a different story, but perforation of the intestine can lead to the peritonitis. Does that make sense? So it gets progressively worse. In some cases, amoeba become extra intestinal and they can migrate into the liver and the lungs. In the liver, they manif in both liver and lungs, they manifest as the formations called amoeboma. In the liver, amoeboma usually presents itself as the necrotic lesion, something like a bubble, fluid-filled necrotic lesion. Um, that that is dangerous. <laughs> okay, it's kind of uh, screws up the liver function. Way more interesting, in my opinion, is amoeboma of the lungs. When amoeba reaches the, the lung tissue, it is immediately attacked by phagocytic cells, macrophages and neutrophils. But often these phagocytic cells fail to get rid of amoeba, so it forms that um, swollen node. That's why we call it amoeboma. Oma is, you know, the body. Does that make sense so far? And then, person has problems with breathing because, you know, if there are multiple amoebomas in the lung, or even one, but pretty big, it hurts, it impairs the respiratory function, it causes inflammation, so accumulation of mucus, cough. The person, if the person has all those respiratory symptoms, the person goes to a physician, what does physician order? Lung problems, x-ray, chest x-ray. And what physician sees on that chest x-ray? Some foreign body in the lungs, like a tumor. In majority of cases, amoebomas are misdiagnosed as the lung cancer. I consider it to be more on the bright side. Because think about the poor patient who was diagnosed with the lung cancer, goes for biopsy, of course, you have to biopsy. They take biopsy and tell them, relax, it's not lung cancer. You have parasitic infestation of the lung, which is totally treatable, by the way, totally treatable, and people recover from this. Okay. Um, now, how important it is? It is important. 100,000 deaths worldwide. We of course talk about Africa, India, Southeast Asia, regions where the food contamination with fecal matter is pretty common. Okay. Um, for the disease like that and practically any other, there are other parasitic disease, protozoan disease of the digestive tract. And I never, I mentioned Cryptosporidium parvum before. I mentioned Giardia lambli. The best way to get rid of protozoa is to boil the water. The advantage, sort of advantage of these guys is that they are not temperature resistant. Simple boiling kills them all. Okay, um, Proper treatment at the water treatment plants kills 99.99999% of those protozoa. UV light is sometimes shows certain effective, uh, effectiveness against those guys, okay? Well, malaria. Actually, yes. Oh, question now. The word. Th did anyone, did anyone study French? What does malaria mean? Bad air. Why? Why we call this disease? Well, why historically this disease is called bad air? Yep, people thought that it's transmitted by air. 
It is called by apicomplex and protozoa, which I showed you before, called Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium avali, Plasmodium malariae, there's Plasmodium nolzai, multiple species. It's transmitted by the mosquito. Anophilus, Anophilus species, different Anophilin mosquitoes. And you can see that epidemiology of malaria includes the entire Southeast Asia, India, Africa, uh, parts of Arabian Peninsula, South America. So if you go again, if you, let's let's see, we already started to plan a trip to Africa. So what vaccine should you take when you go to Africa? Vaccine. Yellow, yellow fever vaccine. Nothing that you should do while in Africa is to take prophylaxis for malaria. You don't want to bring it home. I mean, treatable, but no prophylaxis. It was the first disease. Well, let's put it this way. The first disease for which the arthropod transmission was proven was babesiosis. It's a protozoan disease that's transmitted by ticks in the United States. So Ronald Ross, British epidemiologist, first demonstrated that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes between birds. Italian epidemiologist by the name Grazi uh, first demonstrated that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes between humans. Guess who's got the Nobel Prize? Only one of them got the Nobel Prize. It was Ronald Ross, because they all were assholes. Um, Sir Robert Koch, whose postulates were learned, came to Grazi's lab to do something, to learn something. It turns out Koch wasn't really a good experimental scientist. He couldn't handle a microscope. Grazi, who was a very outspoken Italian person, told him, Dude, how do you do science? You can't even handle a microscope. Koch was offended, and he was a part of the Nobel Selection Committee. So when he was presented with either giving the Nobel Prize to Grazi or Ross, he gave it to Robert Self, so Ronald Ross. He got the Nobel Prize for establishing the malaria transmission. Um, numbers on the epidemiology are different. Three billion people, half of the world population pretty much are addressed. 200 million cases. Now, you have to appreciate it's not 200 million new cases. 200 million people are sick. Many of them can be reinfected. Different estimates give you the numbers from three to 500,000 deaths a year. It is a lot, but what makes it more terrifying, 90% of those deaths are children. Children before the age of five. Disease is incubation period about a couple of weeks, and after that, so you have a clinical picture, which is fatigue, aches, nausea, diarrhea. May not be diarrhea, but the most remarkable symptom is the chills and fever. It's not just fever. It's not ju just chills. People's, people's are shaking. It's a shaking chills. People bite their tongue. They shake so much. It lasts for two, three days. Then it goes away. It comes back. In some cases, it can last for a day, then come back on the fourth day. In some cases, it can come back after two weeks. But it's going to come back and come back and come back if untreated. And you can imagine it's really inconvenient. Like every fourth or third day, you are absolutely 100% incapacitated. The impact of malaria on the societies in Africa is very hard to overestimate. Now, what determines that rhythmicity? Why, say, people in Southeast Asia would experience those 
bouts of chills every two weeks, people in Africa every two, three days. Turns out that it is linked to the species of plasmodium people are infected with. Does that make sense? Because they have slightly different tempo of their life cycle. Does that make sense? Think about this. So people with, say, plasmodium falciparum will have the chills every third day. People with plasmodium ovale it's probably going to be every two weeks. Does that make sense? It actually helps to diagnose. Um, we have no vaccine against malaria. And we have drugs. Chloroquine, mefloquine, quinine. Um, uh, now, actually, quinine, the original anti-malarial drug, was isolated from the bark of one South American tree. Local Native Americans in South America, they, for centuries, used to chew that bark, and that alleviated malaria. Does that make sense? So when you go to Africa, you will be, if, if you smart enough, you go to physician, you know, tell them, look, I am going to Tanzania for a safari or just, you know, national park. Physician will probably prescribe you things like mefloquine or chloroquine to take with you. And you will have to take those drugs every day. They do have side effect, which is quite surprising. The side effect of these drugs is dreams. Very disturbing, almost hallucinatory dreams. And I read accounts of people who took this drug, some of them, the dreams were so disturbing psychologically that they decided to stop taking drugs. And some of them actually caught malaria later and had to, you know, treat it. So it's not just you have some vivid dreams. No, it's it's extremely disturbing. You still sleep though. Okay. So, um, how can we control? I was at the conference on malaria treatments once. I felt like an idiot. But I was one of maybe two people who actually presented the... I didn't do malaria, it was vector control, but... I was the only one of two people who presented biology paper. Everything else was about bed nets and repellents. That's how we do control malaria. If you go, if you leave, if you go to Africa and you like spend time outside, you gotta have a bed net. It prevents it, reduces malaria. Distribution of bed nets is one of the most effective ways to curb the malaria spread. Another thing is, of course, mosquito control. We now have some works. There's a bacterium called Wolbachia, which, in some weird way, decreases the population of mosquitoes, does something to mosquitoes. I don't remember the mechanism. It decreases the population of anopheline mosquitoes, essentially reducing the transmission. There are attempts to make sterile mosquitoes that will be able to kind of transfer sterility to others. So essentially, you get mosquitoes out of the equation. Um, but here's the thing. First of all, malaria killed more American soldiers during the World War II than weapons. Yeah, there are more people died from malaria in the Pacific Ocean uh, uh, battles than from battles. But then malaria went away in Africa, in Southeast Asia, everywhere it went away. As did yellow fever and West Nile and dengue. All those mosquito transmitted diseases went away very quickly after the war. But they, they came back about 1965, 67. Any idea? And they just they had a surge of mosquito borne diseases all over the world at the end of the 60s. And it, keeps on going by now. What exactly? 
DDT. They stopped using DDT. Before that, um, humanity was spraying DDT left and right, and it was really effective. It killed a shitload of insects, really. Mosquitoes were, like, under humanity's boot, okay? They were gone, pretty much. Turns out, though, that DDT was teratogenic, carcinogenic, all kinds of crazy shit. So they stopped using it. And just, you know, they, they didn't just say, okay, let's think. They just, no, we're not going to use it anymore. Well, mosquitoes had a field day. Now, the idea, it may sound crazy, but many scientists now say it was a mistake. Mistake was also how we used it, because it was spraying from the plates. The idea now is to bring DDT back but use it in Africa, one part of the house, to prevent mosquitoes from getting into the home. Windows. To spray around windows. Studies, as crazy as it sounds, showed that mosquitoes land on the windowsill often. If you cover windowsill with a layer of DDT, they will die. And it, in experimental studies, it showed efficacy. So by using DDT responsibly, not spraying it all over the place, but just treating certain, certain regions of the house, you can significantly reduce the mosquitoes getting into the house. Does that make sense? And the following question is, why? There is no malaria transmission in the United States. A few reasons. First, we talk, same, same as we discussed before. We are inside. And second, it, it pretty much what eliminated malaria in uh, Decreased malaria transmission in 19th century. Those were the people who actually drained the swamp. To increase the area that could be useful for agriculture, they quite literally drained the swamps in Louisiana, Mississippi, and other southern states, which were hotbed for malaria. And that's it. Mosquitoes didn't have a breeding ground. There we go. So we do have every year there are uh, several imported cases of malaria in the US and usually there is one or two so-called autochthonous cases. So when person with malaria is beaten by mosquito, this mosquito transmitted transmits it to another person and another person has it and then that's it. That's that's all transmission. Okay? We're going to wrap it up.